um, I spent 25, 26 years in academia as a research scientist, as a senior lecturer, as a professor of health science, specializing in the physiology of rest and exercise, human nutrition, cardiovascular pathophysiology, and statistics and research methodology. So I kind of that's that's the underpinning credentials wise. I've got three advanced research degrees for what that's worth and in, in three different subjects uh, aligned with those particular areas of interest. So you can rely on what I say to be scientifically valid and have great veracity, despite the fact that the language I'm using to describe people who see things otherwise is not what you might expect. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, obviously, I never used to stand up in front of groups of students in a university setting and use that kind of language. Of course not. Um, but this is an entertainment business at the end of the day, the YouTube thing, the, the, the social media thing, all of that. And so I'm just playing the game. Um, but yes, my, what I'm saying is underpinned by a lot of experience. Um, I have a long list of peer-reviewed publications as first author, first investigator, I have a list of multi-million dollar external consultancies under my belt. Um, I've taught literally tens of thousands of students over the years to both undergraduate and postgraduate research degrees as well. I've acted as a peer reviewer for multiple journals. So the runs are on the board. There's, there's no question that I have the credentials. Um, so Bart, today I want to get into a few different things with you. So um, first, I, I think we could do a bit of role playing. I think this might be a little bit of fun because you're a fun guy. Oh, my favorite thing. My favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that I could play the role of the vegan. You know, I've been, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you know my background, but I've been pretty sick for a number of years and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, lost a lot of weight. I'm pretty, uh, you know, kind of an emaciated, uh, nutritionally depleted guy. So it, it shouldn't be too hard for you to, to imagine them a vegan, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, so we could go through that, that role playing, um, sure. and then for the carnivores later, and maybe I'll edit this video a little bit, you know, just to split up a little bit, but, uh, for the carnivores later, I'm going to get into some fun carnivore specific questions for you. Okay. So I think we're going to have okay. lots of fun today. Um, cool. so just, just to clarify, would you like me to keep this clean and respectful or do you want me to play no. the character? No, that's not my channel. So you, you. Go your character like 110%. All right. All. So you want to be sworn at. You're what you're saying. You want to be sworn at. <laughs> I want to uh, Okay, good. I'm glad we're on the same page. Yeah, full, full on, re uh, full on role playing. Okay. Um, okay. Mm. So, um, but before we get into that, I just want to ask you about my blood work here. Okay. I actually just got my blood work sure. the other day. Uh, I'm not going to put it up on the screen here because I don't really want to share my personal information, but. Um, my LDL was at 298. Uh, mm -hmm. my HDL was over 80 and my mm -hmm. triglycerides were around 50. Now okay. my doctor thinks that I should go on a statin and, yeah. um, he was quite worried about my health actually. So I thought, mm -hmm. uh, I would just talk it over with you first. Um, so what do you yeah. think? Do you think I'm about to blow a gasket or, or what's happening here? No. Your doctor is trained to think a certain way, but not only trained to think a certain way, your doctor is absolutely mandated to think a certain way and to communicate with you in a certain way. Your doctor is mandated by the licensing board of the Medical Council of Canada to tell you that if your LDL is above this level X, then you are to be prescribed a statin and your doctor is to lean on you as hard as possible to get you to comply, to take that statin, because they are told that uh, cholesterol, particularly a thing that they will call LDL cholesterol, is causal in heart disease, and as such, it needs to be reduced to reduce your risk of developing heart disease in the next X number of years. Unfortunately, the whole argument falls to bits as soon as you start to look at it scientifically. 
Now, don't forget my background is in cardiovascular pathophysiology. So if anybody knows what does and does not cause heart disease, it is a professor of cardiovascular pathophysiology. So hello. First problem, LDL cholesterol does not exist. There is no such thing as LDL cholesterol. If you look in any biochemistry textbook you like anywhere in the world, you will find a diagram that shows the molecule cholesterol. It'll say, here is a molecule of cholesterol, do, 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 do. carbons, hydrogens, all that kind of stuff. There aren't different forms of it. There isn't one called HDL cholesterol. There isn't one called LDL cholesterol. There's only one form, it is cholesterol. The HDL and LDL parts, they're appending there, are not cholesterol at all. They are lipoproteins, meaning they are protein fat molecules or phospholipoproteins really, because there's quite a bit of phosphorus involved as well. And these are actually carriers. These are the delivery agent. You cannot dissolve um, lipids in water. Cholesterol is a lipid. It will not dissolve in water. It is not a polar molecule, water is a polar molecule. If you pour a lipid on top of water, it won't mix, it will sit on top, they will be separated. So you need a package to package up fats and to travel them around in your blood, otherwise they would just separate out of your blood, that wouldn't work. And that's what lipoproteins do. There are several classes of lipoprotein. There are low density, LDL, there are medium, or intermediate density, IDL. There are high density, HDL. And there's also another class called Kylie microns as well, if you're really interested in that kind of stuff. The When you go and get your blood test done and it says your HDL is, your LDL is, your total cholesterol is, what they're doing is they're measuring how much cholesterol in total there is in your blood. And then they are apportioning that cholesterol, which is identical, remember, there's only one molecule. This is the cholesterol carried by that lipoprotein. This is the fraction of it. This is how much was carried by the low density lipoprotein. And it's very interesting to note that invariably on a standard blood test, when they say your, they say your LDL portion of your cholesterol, your low density lipoprotein cholesterol was X, in your case, what did you say? 290 or something stupid like that. Um, that is an estimate. It is not measured as such. It is an estimate with a degree of error, a bracket of figures that could be anything, and it's really quite wide. Okay, let's accept that the number that they've given you is remotely accurate, which it probably is not, but let's just say it is. And let's say your LDL really is touching 300 milligrams per deciliter, I presume is what you're, you're talking about there. And what they'll say to you is, well, we really want your LDL below 70. You're at nearly 300. You're going to die next week from heart disease. You're at real risk here. So we need to put you on this statin medication to get your LDL down. So that then leads us to the problem where we go, well, okay, are there any experiments in existence anywhere in the peer-reviewed literature where they take genetically identical people at, a, at an exact age, whatever that is, preferably at birth for real scientific uh, integrity, and they lock those twins, sets of twins, as, as many as they need for statistical power, so hundreds and hundreds and thousands of sets of identical twins, and they split those identical twins up and they put half the twins in one lab, half the twins in another lab, where they control every single aspect of their lives down to the number of daylight hours, the color of the light, the amount of exercise, how that exercise is undertaken, how those people are treated and spoken to, exactly how they're fed, including the exact intake of saturated fat or cholesterol or whatever it is they're looking at, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they follow those people until those people die of heart disease or anything else. That, that experiment does not exist. Obviously, of course it doesn't. You can't do that ethically. If you could get past an ethics committee, which you never will, to do a study like that, how are you going to pay for that? Because that's going to cost billions of dollars to do. 
um, how are you going to find hundreds of thousands of sets of twins who are prepared to give up their entire life for the betterment of science? Or are we going to genetically create these people? And that's a really ethical problem, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So just forget it. It's just there is no experiment that proves cause and effect. So what we have is inference. The problem with the inferences that we have is that they're all based on either epidemiology, which is not remotely anything akin to science at all. It's not controlled. It's not disciplined. It's pseudoscience dressed up as science made to look like it can inform on cause and effect. It absolutely cannot. Or a sub-branch of epidemiology called Mendelian randomization, which looks at the differences in genes between persons and says, look, according to associations with their genomic makeup, here is their likelihood of this, that, or the other thing, which again is just another form of association. So that's not cause and effect either. So anyone that says we are absolutely certain that cholesterol, and in particular, somehow the cholesterol carried by low-density lipoprotein is causal in heart disease, because why would it be any different from lipo from cholesterol carried by any other carrier? It's the same molecule exactly, don't know. But somehow that's causal, they say. Well, I say, fine, show me the experiment that backs that up. There isn't one, ergo, forget it. It's, it's ridiculous. You look at the largest associative data set that's in existence anywhere in the world, and that is a graph that I'm always showing on my videos on my channel, which is produced by um, the British Heart Foundation and the World Health Organization, not working together. This is not a peer-reviewed article. This is their published data on this versus that. So the British Heart Foundation have measured the total and LDL cholesterol and averaged it out for people in 168 different countries, several hundred million data points around the world. And on the other axis, if we look at the age adjusted death rates in all of those countries, and we plot the death rate per 100,000 persons per year versus their cholesterol level, what we get is a graph that shows us that the lower your cholesterol, total cholesterol that is, the lower that is below 220, the more that associates with death from all causes and from every subcause as well. So heart disease, cancers, strokes, you name it, all the big killers, every single one of them all follow the same trend. You drop your cholesterol total below 220, your risk goes up, well, you know, risk, your incidence of death goes up, 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 and quite precipitously up, quite markedly up. So to me, there's just nothing underpinning this ridiculous idea about cholesterol as a causal agent in heart disease. Atherosclerosis, which causes heart disease, is caused by chronic systemic inflammation. Of that, there is no doubt whatsoever. Anyone who understands cardiovascular pathophysiology at all will back me up on that and say, yep, absolutely, it is chronic systemic inflammation. It is not the concentration of circulating cholesterol in your blood. And as such, lowering that is not only unlikely to be helpful because it's not the cause of the problem in the first place, but actually the drugs that they prescribe to do that, statins and PSK9 inhibitors, are vastly grossly dangerous. They are contraindicated metabolic poisons that cause so many very, very dangerous side effects that what you actually get is that graph that I was talking about where the risk of the risk of the incidence of death goes up and up and up as cholesterol level goes down and down and down. So it just doesn't stand even basic cursory refutation. There is no argument existing anywhere in the literature that can back that up. Again, sorry for the very long answer, but this is the stuff that is my bread and butter. And so I need to be very, very clear on it. So no, cholesterol does not cause heart disease, does not only should you not lower your cholesterol because that will lower your risk of heart disease somehow, you absolutely should not do that because it will, if anything, increase your risk. So your doctor needs to go and get reschooled, but your doctor won't because the medical council will need to completely change their entire attitude and they won't. Why not? Because they're in the pocket of big pharma who make drugs to, to lower your cholesterol. Sorry about that. Yeah, but Barbara, what about all these credible uh, institutions that are saying that saturated fat is causal 
uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms of atherosclerosis. Is that right. does that hold any right. so, uh, weight? No, no. So anytime you say, or anytime anybody says saturated fat is associated with heart disease, you can strike that organization off as being credible straight away. They are not credible. Here's why. There are five major meta-analyses in the literature now that exist. All of them have multi-million person years of follow-up in their design of their meta-analytical structures. All of them cover um, more than 12 to, I think it's 12 or 15 sub-studies that make up those analyses. All five major analyses agree. All of them say there is not even an association between the intake of saturated fat and the incidence of heart disease, let alone a causal relationship that explains any um, correlation that may have existed. Basically, if you can show that, that A is not associated with B, then why would you be looking for a reason why A is associated with B when you can show that A is not associated with B. So there is not one dissenting voice in the peer-reviewed literature in terms of meta-analyses that says saturated fat is even associated with heart disease, let alone the cause of it. So any organization who claims to be credible, who says it is, is not credible. They are lying to you. They will be looking at a small-scale study that's an outlier. So All why, do they seem, why do they seem so determined to play, uh, uh, you know, place the, uh, the, the blame on saturated fat? Why are there so many organizations that are so, sort of demonizing saturated fat and going after it year after yep. year? We see these studies yep. and so on and so forth. What is it? Okay. That, you know, are we concerned? Most, serious? What, is, what yeah. is going on here? Okay. Most of them are taking their lead from other another organization, that organization being the Dietetics Association of America and the other dietetic associations affiliated with that one around the world. That organization holds a standpoint which is bought and paid for by a number of organizations, including Big Pharma and Big Agriculture, who have a bottom right-hand corner to subserve. Also, if you trace the history of the Dietetics Association, you will find they are tied up very, very inextricably with the Church of the Seventh-day Adventists, who also push a, a vegan slash vegetarian ideology. It is all ideological and or financial and or both is why they push these ideas. All one has to do is look at the actual peer-reviewed science and that will give you the clear and unambiguous answer as to whether saturated fat is problematic or is not. And the answer is it is not unequivocally without any doubt whatsoever that means. Yes. Well, it is interesting that uh, big pharma has been buying up a lot of our agriculture, isn't it? So uh, what mm. interests do they exactly have to protect? Well, they have their ideology to protect, that being the fact that you should eat plants. And the only thing they've got that suggests that you should eat plants is their insistence on their argument that for some reason, eating an animal-based diet will do you harm. Um, because they can't point to anything that shows that plants are health-promoting, because there is no evidence to support that claim, never has been. So they have to actually take shots at the alternative lifestyle, I guess, which is either a mixed diet of both plants and animals, or even worse, a diet consisting of only animal products. Goodness me. So what they have to do is take shots at animal products and say, right, red meat will give you cancer, they say. No, there's no evidence for that anywhere in the literature. It does not exist. Um, saturated fat will cause heart disease, they say. No, that does, that's not right either. Uh, cholesterol will kill you, they say. No, wrong again. Um, oh, if you don't eat enough plant material, you won't have the right gut microbiome and you'll get colon cancer. No, again, just fabricated nonsense, all of it. Instead of saying, here's why plants are health promoting, they're saying, here's how we can try and undercut the consumption of animal products. The only problem with that really, other than it's just nonsense, is that if you 
understand Darwinian. I'm, I'm going to call it Darwinian theory because that's what most people call it. It is not a theory. Evolution is a thing, people. It's real, okay? Positive and negative selection pressures are real. If you have any doubts whatsoever, just check out what's happening with this pandemic that's going on at the moment, okay? All right. Even though viruses are not even a living thing, they, but they do have genetic material which is, which is uh, selected for and against, okay? We can do the same thing with bacteria. We can see it very quickly because bacteria have very short lifespans. They replicate very quickly. So we can see genetic drift happening because it happens rapidly. We can't see it in people because it happens slowly. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It does. Okay. So if we live a certain lifestyle as a species for a significant period of time, those genes that support that lifestyle will be selected for, and the genes that are unhelpful to us will be selected against and knocked out of our genome over time. That's how it works, okay? Whether you like it or not, sorry, that's how it is. Then you go to another branch of actual science. You go to some anthropology type people that have got these machines that can measure the speciation of carbon and nitrogen isotopes found in the collagen of long bones of human remains of all ages up to and including 350,000 years of age found anywhere around the planet. They can test the collagen in those long bones and say how much nitrogen 13, sorry, 14 and 15 was there, how much carbon 12 and 13 are there, blah, 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 blah. That gives us a clear, unambiguous absolute slam dunk this is what that human being definitely did eat in their lifetime so it's not even a guess it's, this is what that person ate anyway the results are within five percent one way or the other for every single set of collagen they have ever tested on any human skeletal remains over eight thousand years old up to and including three hundred and fifty thousand years old our diet changed remarkably around 8,000 years ago due to the agrarian revolution. Prior to that, here's what human beings absolutely did eat according to the collagen isotopes. The meat and fat of large ruminant animals almost exclusively. Did they eat any significant amount of plant material? The answer is no, they did not, full stop. So what genes are selected for? How are our organ systems designed? Do we have a cecum which would allow us to be hindgut fermenters of plant material? No, we don't anymore. It's about that size now. It's called a vestigial appendix on the end of our colon. It's a thing that usually gets infected and has to get cut out at some point in our lives. You look at a gorilla and that thing's like, because they're designed to eat plant material and we are not. Um, and then you look at the... The, the relative volume and surface area of the large versus the small intestines of us versus gorillas, they are inverted. You look at all the comparative anatomy and physiology, you look at the organ systems, you look at the metabolic pathways, you look at anything you like, and it all points to human beings as obligate hypercarnivores. So why would we have genes still after at least 350,000 years, that would lead us to an early death by eating what we've eaten for that period of time. That doesn't make any sense. That would mean that Darwin is completely wrong, and he wasn't. He was completely correct in his theory of evolution. As it turns out, when you look at the, um, the inferences, it looks like humans... Although we can say definitely without question 350,000 years eating meat and animal fat, it looks like it's more likely to be about four and a half million years, which gives us a whole another perspective on that positive and negative selection pressures. Are we designed to eat meat? You bet you'll ask we are. Yep. So hold on, Barty. Okay, yeah. you're, you're blowing my mind here for a second. Okay, so if I get you right, you're mm -hmm. saying that for the last four and a half million years, we mm -hmm. haven't been poisoning ourselves by eating saturated fatty meat. That, Correct. that we weren't choosing to um, 
or, or, or that it would be a better choice for us to have seed oils, like, you know, to go after soy, maybe get some tofu scramble, you mm. know, instead mm. of, instead of our, our eggs. Um, okay. Are you, are you saying that, that we have actually been living off of saturated fats as like a source of nutrition for us for all these years or were we just sort yes. of a suicidal suicidal species we have absolutely been consuming the flesh and associated animal fats of largely ruminant animals for four and one half million years that's exactly what i'm saying okay further to that seed oils have been available to us for roughly 100 years 100 not four and one half million. Our bodies are absolutely not designed to deal with seed oils. They are pro-inflammatory. They activate two separate inflammatory pathways in the human body. And we know absolutely that the underpinnings of heart disease, most cancers, most forms of dementia, um, most of the, the major killers of people in society. I can't even say society. Goodness. <laughs> anyway. It's late here. I, I, I can't say straight today. <laughs> no, it's been um, it's been it's been Christmas. It's been yeah. Boxing Day, and we've been enjoying it. Anyway, that's that. Um, you know, seed oils, eighty years, pro-inflammatory. They lead to all the big killers. Why do you think, as a society, our rates of obesity, which is also underpinned by inflammation, by the way, heart disease, cancer, um, all the big killers? They are all down to the sudden addition of seed oils in the last hundred years. Again, tofu. Tofu is a human invention, and it's a human invention of the last hundred years or so, especially in its certain form and its its current form. Not to mention, pretty much every single plant-based food that you could put into your mouth that you could go and buy today from any supermarket anywhere in the world, those plants are nothing whatsoever like the plants that we started to eat even 8,000 years ago. We have totally changed the plant material by selective breeding. Another example of how Darwin was not wrong. Um, so we've made our fruits and vegetables juicier, sweeter, um, more appealing, more colorful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also much more adept those plant materials are at filling their tissues up with toxins, anti-nutrients and things that are absolutely designed to do us, to do us in. Do you, do you really think plants want us to eat them? Of course they don't. Animals can try and escape from you, run away from you, hide under a rock, dive into a stream, fly away some of them, whatever it is. Plants are rooted to the spot. They've only got one way of defending themselves and that's through toxin and you bet they do it. Absolutely. Okay. So um, that, I think that sort of leads us into uh, let's play the vegan uh, carnivore role here. Or, uh, you know, I'll play the role. Cool. Of the vegan. Unless you want to play the cool. role of the vegan, totally up to you. God, no. God, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're up for that. <laughs> Could you imagine if I did that? Someone would take the, the, the video of that and take it all out of context and say, look, 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 he's a vegan. Well, that's, that's what I was hoping to do, Bart. I was going to sell to the, all the vegan channels. It's going oh, to make a, sorry about I was that. going to make a fortune off of it. Oh, well, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <Even> the vegan. <laughs> um, so first off, I was going to challenge you to a colonoscopy contest. So I okay. eat 50, 50 grams of fiber a day. I have amazing shits yep. all day long. And yep. I'd make a bet that you probably haven't had a shit in five years being on a carnivore diet. Am I correct? Right. You are not correct, you ass monkey. You complete fuck hat. No, you are completely wrong. I have one bowel motion, perfectly formed, once a day, every day at a time I could set my fucking clock to. I lay a rope, one and done. It's not even usually broken into stanzas. There's no pushing. There's no straining. I sit down. It's like the the soft sludge machine at uh, McDonald's. Done. Lay a coil of rope. Flush it away. Finished. Perfect every time. Well, it's, maybe it's amazing because they'll tell you that you need fiber to shit. Well, you don't. Yeah. 
Well, mm -hmm. um, I could tell you that I, I just shit all day long. So, um, yep. so, so, well, let's talk about shits then. Okay. So let's talk about cows. Okay. So, um, right. you know, apparently all the, the, uh, environmental gas and everything, it's, it's all coming from methane. It's coming from cow shits. Um, uh -huh. have you not got the memo on that? And how, how do you live with yourself being a carnivore and destroying the earth? Right. Okay. So the average plate of food like slop in a form of food, uh, which is plant-based food substitute that is on the plate of every vegan that they put down their gobs five, six, and seven times a day, because they are so fucking destitute of any nutrition whatsoever. So you have to eat seven times a day, even to get anywhere near the nutrition you need. Every single one of those plates of food produced by those who produce agriculture type products is associated with not only more um, pollution, but also destruction of the soil, the untimely murder of orders of magnitude, higher numbers of animals. And then we could even possibly consider killing as, as a strictly carnivorous person. There's nitrogen runoff into the waterways from farming. There's, there's agricultural spraying. Um, all of that, of course, in terms of the, you were talking about greenhouse gas in terms of the, uh, the methane situation, wasn't it? Well, you know, first of all, you'd have to believe that the greenhouse effect is um, a viable scientific argument with decent veracity behind it um, i'll leave that for another day i'll just ask the question is it um, others other than myself uh, scientists and other areas of science are asking that question of course they're being silenced by those who have the agenda who have control over the agenda but no one's actually poked any holes in the argument um, in short the argument suggests that the atmosphere of the earth is in thermodynamic equilibrium from top to bottom. There are no um, compartmentalizations thermodynamically there. Ergo, the greenhouse effect cannot possibly work scientifically. Oh dear, how sad, never mind. Um, actual pollution though, nitrogen runoff into waterways, um, glyphosate, that sort of thing. The release of, even if you believe the, the greenhouse gas idea, the release of gas associated with the murder of those hundreds of thousands of animals per plate of food far outweighs anything cows are doing. Um, the number of cows or large ruminant animals burping and farting methane on the planet now is a lot less than it was actually, even 8,000 years ago. So just, you know, ideology, you know, you want to talk about science any, any time you like, we can talk about science, but mostly vegans don't want to talk about science. They want to talk about ideology. They want to say, how can you kill animals for your food? Well, if you work it out by the amount of meat that I would eat on a daily basis, I could live off one cattle beast for a year. I could be directly responsible for the death of one animal per year to feed myself. Vegans kill hundreds of thousands of animals for every single plate of food they eat. The mere fact that you're not actually eating those animals doesn't mean your food didn't kill them. It did. Unequivocal. There's no two ways around this. You lose. The goon. <laughs> but and, you know, and how do you, how do you virtue signal? You are in no position to virtue signal. You have no science behind you at all. Well, I, I think well, Dr. Dr. Michael Greger would disagree with that. But uh, Oh, you mean what, Dr. Michael Greger? <laughs> Michael Greger has never practiced medicine not one day in his life. Not ever. Did you know that? Michael Greger finished his exams to become a medical doctor, after which what you do to get registered to be a medical doctor is you go and do a residency somewhere. He never did that. He is not a doctor. Go on, well, I, tell I, us about not Dr. Michael Greger. I, I, I think you'll find, you know, in the future that, that us vegans will be on the right side of history and that you 
carnivores are just a bunch of puppets for the dairy and meat industry industry and uh, well, you can like, think that all you like you will be wrong you will not be on the right side of history because history is what's happened in the past and i can tell you what we've done at least for the last three hundred and fifty thousand years and probably more likely for the last four and one half million charlie brown and that is we have eaten the meat and fat of animals, large ruminants, who actually create a renewable resource in terms of pasture lands and keep that viable. It's actually a massive carbon sink, which when you destroy that ecosystem and you kill those animals off, whoops, desertification is what happens. It destroys the environment. The carbon sink no longer is in effect. All that carbon gets released back into the atmosphere, which is going to have no effect on the uh, on the climate anyway. But that's for another day, as I say. Have another crack. <laughs> so, um, so us vegans, you're saying that it's just an ideology, right? Correct. Well, it's not only just an ideology; it's also a theology. There is a thing that that. I refer to as, well, there's a thing I refer to as the Church of Anorexia Vegana. And it's because of the fervent theological belief in your ideology as put forward by the high priests of the Church of Anorexia Vegana, who invariably tend to be physicians, who, by the way, physicians have exactly no training whatsoever in nutrition, none at all to speak of. And they're, they're, they're leaning on the perceived credibility of the medical qualification as credence to speak about an area completely outside of their remit, that being nutrition and human physiology, actually. um, Medical doctors are not trained in in human physiology at all. They are trained in allopathic medicine. It's a different thing completely. Okay. So I'm, I'm feeling a little bit dirty being a vegan. I don't know if I could do this anymore, Bart, but um, so <laughs> let's, let's call it, let's, let's call a spade a spade. Okay. So are yeah. you kind of, you're kind of saying that, that vegans and doctors are puppets of, of big pharma and, you know, they've, they've sort of have permeated this misinformation about saturated fats bad for you. You know, they're, they're blaming cow shits on, on the, mm-hmm. the state of like, you know, environmentalism and, um, yeah. and they, they sort of, you know, I, I know the big pharma is like the largest, um, lobby group in the world. Yeah. So is this, is this something that, that, you, you know, you believe that they're sort of all under the wing, you know, do people sort of call you conspiracy theorists for all this? And it kind of sounds like you're, you're, you know, I mean, where, where does this come from? It sort of sounds like conspiracy to me. Well, everything I say about human physiology, human nutrition, the needs nutritionally of human beings, our organ systems, our metabolic pathways, everything about us that makes up who we are, that is all underpinned by the appropriate areas of science that can inform on those areas. The last area of science that can actually inform on human nutrition needs is the area of science called human nutrition science. That is the the bit that's been carved out by a self-interested group of people who are funded largely by, by big agra and by big pharma. They have bought and paid for position statements. They have bought and paid for Uh, appeal to authority fallacy. They have bought and paid for government position statements. They have lobbied. They have spent billions and billions of dollars to put together a propaganda program to convince people that meat is bad and that it should be at least limited, if not completely eliminated from the diet, which flies completely in the face of what the science, the actual science tells us, and the actual science is found in comparative anatomy, comparative physiology, metabolic pathways, and the anthropology. Anything but the actual nutrition science, which is an ideology. The areas of science where there is experimentally verifiable data that we can go to and say, okay, 
How, how have you determined what human beings definitely did eat for the last 350,000 years without question? Well, we did that by looking at the nitrogen isotope balance in the collagen of the long bones that remains for millions of years after, well, hundreds of thousands of years after the death of that individual. It, it is a stable isotope. It doesn't change over time. The mixture of that in the collagen tells us what that person did eat. Definitely, no question. That's actual science, for example. We look at comparative anatomy and we say, okay, animals that are designed to eat plants have a cecum, a functional cecum that acts as um, an organ that allows a significant amount of hind gut fermenting to be done. Do we have that? No, we do not. It's gone. It's about that big now. Okay. Um, oh, yes, but teeth, though, we don't have sharp, pointy teeth like this, says Dr. R. R. Milton R. 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 Mills R. R. doesn't he? And that's where you bring in the positive and negative selection pressure argument. Okay, here it is. Remember I said earlier that those things that are useful are genes that are selected for, and those genes that are unhelpful to us are selected against, and those things are knocked out. Example of a gene that was deleterious, a gene that was a problem to us and is knocked out of the human, human genome. It is gone. There are no human beings alive today who carry the gene that allows us to create the enzyme whereby we could create vitamin C in our own body. It's not that it was just not helpful. It was a problem. It is gone. Every human being who ever carried that gene died before they were able to reproduce so creating vitamin c ourselves was a problem in our lifestyle i could explain what it is on another day but we don't want this to be too long okay however having teeth the shape and structure that we have which look almost entirely like a frugivore's teeth you'll see that thing that they often show here's a carnivore's teeth sharp pointy teeth like this here is uh, an omnivore's teeth, the horse's teeth, you know. Here is the this, and then, and then they get to, here's a frugivore's teeth. Here's an ape with teeth almost like ours. Here's ours. Look, they look very similar. We must be frugivores, they say. Here's the thing. Human beings have never, ever taken down large woolly mammoths by diving at them headlong with our mouths open to tear open their throats with our teeth, have we? No. We did it with sharp pointy sticks and rocks and things like that because we have brains and thumbs and we can fashion these tools, okay? So in my life, which is now nearly 50 years on this planet, I have never once sat down to a plate of steak and gone, I can't eat this. I don't have sharp pointy teeth like this. I have a knife and a fork. Do, do, do. Nom, 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 nom. I've always been able to eat the steak just fine. It's not a problem. There's no reason for our tooth shape to have to change by positive or negative selection pressure. So they didn't particularly. If anything, the robustitude of our jaw lines and teeth structures became atrophied and all screwed up by um, eating a lot of plant material in the last 8,000 years. So there you go. Well, Bart, so I, I want, let's review something, okay? I just pulled up something on my yeah. screen here. Let's take a look at the Canada Food Guide, okay? Do you see that? Oh, shit, yeah. Uh, it's coming up. Oh, hang on. There it is. Yep, the Food Guide. Got it. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Do you see everything else? Okay, there we go. Do you see it? Yeah. Yeah. So Canada Food Guide, okay? So this is what mm -hmm. we should be eating here. So are you telling me that throughout history, you're telling me that we were um, supposed to be eating bread and noodles. And it looks like maybe this might be pancakes over here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, at the bottom of the food chain was, it looks like meat, fish. Yeah. It looks like there's a kebab there, a turkey. So yeah. Uh, yeah. so what, what's wrong with this picture? I mean, this is, this is made up by, you know, by the experts. How could they be wrong? Okay, well, let me define expert for you. X is an unknown quantity, and a spurt is a drip under pressure. Okay? The food guide for Canadians, as you've just shown to me here on the screen, this is paid for and underpinned 
by the Wheat Growers Association, as also outlined by their almost 100% ownership of the Dietetics Association of Canada. Think about it. Human beings have been around on the planet for 350,000 years in our current form. And four and a half million years prior to that in forms very, very similar to our current form. How long have we been growing wheat, milling wheat, baking bread? All of those things there look like wheat-based products, don't they? Mm. The total amount of time we've been doing that is about 8,000 years. And it has been fucking disastrous for our health. Absolutely fucking disastrous. Our brains have shrunk in the last 8,000 years. Our stature is reduced in the last 8,000 years. Our jaw and dental structure is vastly reduced. All the dental problems that we have, the wisdom tooth problems, all that stuff, comes from the fact that that whole structure is atrophied down because of eating you know, milled seed grains and that kind of stuff. Almost every vegetable and fruit shown on that next ring in there, the green ring, every single one of those is a human invention of the last 8,000 years or less. None of that stuff existed. Inside of that, you've got dairy and dairy-related products, which human beings have been consuming, again, for around about 8,000 years because we domesticated animals about the same time that we started growing wheat. Why? Well, we got oxen in to pull the carts. We'd already been eating the ruminants flesh. We might as well eat their lactations as well. Some clever cookie thought about 8,000 years ago. So that's what we, when we started doing that. And inside that, the smallest ring there is the absolute thing that we have been eating for four and a half million fucking years, almost entirely. 80% plus or minus five of our energy intake has been in the stuff in that inside ring for four and a half million years. It's Everything different. outside yeah. that ring is, a, is an invention in the, eight, in the last 8,000 years. Add seed oils on top of that in the last 100 years, and you wonder why things are going south. I don't know if you could see at the bottom here, it says choose leaner, leaner meats, poultry yep. and fish, as well as dried yep. peas, beans, and nope. lentils nope. more often. No, nope. no, nope. <laughs> none of those things are things you should do. You should choose the fattiest cuts you can possibly find of meat. Not the leanest, the fattest possible. Poultry. Wouldn't our ancestors have, have chosen a nice, maybe a nice uh, white chicken breast over a fatty cut of meat? Is that what you're telling me, Bart? Around about 8,000 years ago, even at the time of the agrarian revolution, the number of chickens alive on the planet was so close to zero as makes no odds. The huge number of poultry that we have on the planet right now is because we selectively breed them so we can eat them doesn't mean they are actually our designated natural food source, which is the meat and associated saturated fat of large ruminant animals. Bovines, and before that, it was largely woolly mammoth. Well, fair enough. That was a good takedown mm. of the uh, Canada Food Guide. I like to call it it's the, the profit nonsense. pyramid. It's criminal. It's criminal. It's, it's the profit Absolutely pyramid. misanthropic. It's It's... it's the people that put that together should be imprisoned for killing millions and millions of Canadians before their time. Because that's what they are doing. 100% mm. agree with you on that one. Um, and, and this is the stuff that really genuinely makes me angry. The stuff you know that they are telling people to avoid our species-appropriate, species-specific diet in favour of one that's been invented in the last 100 years, largely, because someone in a white coat tells you they know better than four and a half million years of, of evolution. Get well, fucked. Well, part of the reason why I like to bring up the food guide is because I went to my daughter's daycare. My daughter's about to turn three, despite what you see in the, that's an old picture mm -hmm. of her. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> she's about to turn three and in her daycare, they have a food guide just like that up in her classroom. Yeah. When all the grains oh, are up, right? You got to get them indoctrinated disgusting. at a young age. Yeah. yeah, you got to teach yeah. them before they can even walk what they should eat. Because here's the thing: put a plate of food, food that is based on plant material, in front of a baby, 
a weaned baby. They're going to go onto solids now. Put plant material in front of them. Will they eat it without being forced? No. Why not? Because their instincts tell them that is not food. That is bad for me. What are you doing, mummy, daddy? Why are you trying to chug, chug, train that into or the plane goes into the airport or whatever? What the fuck is wrong with you? That's not food. I want meat and fat. You offer a child that's been weaned meat and fat, they all yum it down every time, any day of the week. But what Even about, as what children, about, yeah. you have to force a child to eat their vegetables, don't you? You cannot leave the table until you finish this meal of not food, is what we say to them. But where you do cannot you have all, any fat if you don't eat your vegetables. Where do you get all your nutrition from then? Though? What about vitamins like vitamin C and vitamin yeah. A? Where do you get all that stuff from? How do you get that from meat? Okay. Vitamin C and vitamin A is found in the flesh of animals in amounts that are entirely appropriate for human beings. Gosh, it's almost as if we've been eating that way for all oh, four and a half million fucking years. So, you know, why, why would we evolve to require a huge dose of vitamin C, for example, from exogenous plant-based sources, um, if we haven't been eating any amount of plant material for four and a half million years? We wouldn't. We'd evolve a body that needs a lot less vitamin C. As it turns out, the transporter that gets vitamin C out of your bloodstream and into the cells where it's needed to do its job. That transporter is a transporter known as GLUT4, which is the same transporter which transports glucose from the bloodstream into your cells. If you have a huge amount of glucose in your bloodstream, because all, oh, let's say you're pouring carbohydrates down your neck three, four, five times a day, you retarded fucking vegan. <laughs> Then the glucose is out competing the vitamin C. So you need a much higher concentration of vitamin C in your blood to enable any of it to get into your cells. So the RDI for vitamin C is based on the assumption that you're eating a plant-based diet because the food guide tells us to, to consume 65% of our energy in the form of plant materials. We don't need anything like the amount of vitamin C that we're told we need. In fact, if you do consume that amount on a purely carnivorous diet, you'll be poisoning yourself with too much vitamin C. Mm. Yeah, well, okay. So uh, we're winding down a little bit with time here. So I'm going to get some rapid fire questions with you today. Go bananas. <laughs> so this should be a lot of fun. So um, let's see here. I'll start here just one second. So, okay. So Bart, do you think that you'll ever become, there'll ever be a time where you become a plant-based carnivore like Paul Saladino? No chance whatsoever. Will not happen. How about when you, let's say, you know, you're like 80 years old, you know, you're about to kick the can. Um, do you ever see there being a time where, where you'll just say, fuck it. I'm going out in a blaze of glory. I'm going to feast on tofu scramble and almond butter or, or whatever else. Well, I'll be 50 in March, so I'm not that far from 80 relatively to my entire age. Um, I can't imagine that happening. It may happen, of course, because things do change over time. Um, however, I doubt very much that my knowledge will be um, any different then than it is now because the facts will be the same. No, I don't think I will be eating a large amount of plant material ever again. All right. I think as a much younger person, but... All right. So, so let's go. So famous vegans. Okay. Michael Greger. Yep. Yep. Not Pamela Greger, Anderson. Yep. Or Mike. Pamela Kavita. Anderson Lee. What's that? Did you mean Pamela Anderson Lee? The, the famous. Oh, Pamela Baywatch. Anderson. Okay. So Michael Greger, Pamela Anderson Lee, Mike, mm -hmm. the vegan, I don't know his real name. So marry mm -hmm. one, fuck one, kill one. Go. Um, well, if you mean, if you mean, um, if you mean, if you mean, oh, who am I going to kill? So give me that, give them again. So it's Mike the Vegan. Michael Pamela, Greger, Pamela Anderson. Michael Gre oh, I'd kill Mike the Vegan if I had to kill somebody of one of those three. Um, if I had to 
is it marry one and fuck one, but they can't be the same? Can I marry the one I fuck? No, I think I think it has to be separate. You could only marry or fuck. Uh, okay. Um, so I put you in quite the. I suppose marriage. I suppose marriage can be undone. You can't unfuck somebody. So I guess I'd fuck Pamela Anderson Lee, and I guess I'd marry Michael Greger, and then divorce him immediately. <laughs> yeah. Very good answer. Well played. Mm. Mm. Um, so how much? I hope you didn't mean Pam Popper because that would be a completely different story then. <laughs> all right. So how much honey should we eat in a day? None at all, ever. Yeah, so you're 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 sweet enough. Sugar, honey is sugar. Sugar is contraindicated. You should not eat honey ever. None. All right. If we started a GoFundMe for for you mm-hmm. to eat raw turkey testicles on your channel, would you do it? Depends how much you come up with. Probably not. Is that a dare? Uh, sure. If you want to come up with a large amount of money, I'll have a look at it. <laughs> um, so if you had the chance, which carnivore's loins would you like to pour your butter on? Um... I hate to get you in, in trouble with the uh, the wifey. Which kind of was loins, whatever. Um, 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 presumably, you mean a, a reasonably famous one, uh, someone on, on yes. social media? Yes. Um, are we talking strict carnivores or are we talking people that hang around the, do I, you know, do I have a... A scope to play with here, well, or do they it, have to be hard? They could maybe be like 90%. They have to be a well known carnivore okay. celebrity. Right. Um, so I'm, th- I'm thinking Stephanie Person wouldn't be a bad go, but I'm not sure she's 90% carnivore. Um, I've, I've had her on my channel. I think she'd be flattered. Oh, she's a fan of mine, and I'm a fan of hers. So there you go. Um, I'm sure she won't mind me objectifying her in that manner. Um, <laughs> it's it's a compliment. It absolutely is, um, and it's not meant as anything other than that. Um, so I, you have know, you ever I seen did... someone look that young for their age? Like she's no, it's she's ridiculous. Like, she's almost no, fifty five so, now. Yeah, it's absolutely fucking ridiculous. That she looks as good as she does. It's she crazy. she has earned it. She's earned it through hard hard work throughout her life, obviously. But yeah, no, this is a good one. Um, there's probably one or two other examples that I'd probably, I'd probably quite happy go there at the drop of a hat as well. Um, it's a bit, it's a bit hard when you're sort of on the spot like that. But um, yeah. uh, give me some suggestions if you want to, and I go, yeah, yeah, I would, or no, I wouldn't. Yeah, we'll be really, over this, you know. Really but we're, we're, we're totally going to get a lot basted for this. You realize, right? We're ah, gonna- fuck it. They're Whatever. Like, oh, you sexist! You sexist fuck. Yes, yeah. you misogynist pumps, You objectifying well, woman and stuff. Yeah. Well, let's see here. Okay, so we got Michaela Peterson. She's a pretty famous one. We got. Yeah, you couldn't say no to that. You couldn't say no to Michaela, could you? We got steak and butter gal. I've got her. I've got her tomorrow. I better not say anything. But yes, yes, <laughs> quite happily. <laughs> yeah. You know who I yeah. had on my channel recently? I I, I came in think about her in this lake because she's too young but the lady carnivory i know you had her on your channel yep yep she's lovely absolutely yep she's a nice girl i'm trying to think of yep. others it's kind of escaped my mind right now there's so many mm. uh can you think of any others right now i don't know this is a fun game though i like this we should mm. do a whole episode just based on this <laughs> yeah who would you who would you do and who you would who you would <laughs> oh god all right so let's yeah. let's turn the table who is your most mm. hated carnivore? If you just give someone a good punch in the face, just maybe stick Michael Greger's voice on them. Who would you yeah. just like to, to take a bat to? A carnivore that really fucking annoys me is Paul Saladino, and he's not even a carnivore anymore, so he doesn't really even qualify. He annoys me a great deal. So why um, does he annoy you so much? Is it because he changed his stance on his diet and he's saying like, oh, eat honey now? Is that is that what's kind of... It's because he's, yeah, it's because he's lost the plot entirely and he is now telling people to do absolutely the wrong thing for absolutely the wrong reasons. Um, he has basically taken a huge shit where he lives and that's not a good idea. Um, 
another one who used to be carnivore who isn't anymore that annoys the hell out of me is Tefano. Mm. Um, there's a history there as well, of course, between him and I, but that's another for another day. Right. Um, I actually got offside with Tefano by defending Paul Saladino, would you believe, for fuck's sake. <laughs> and then Paul turns around and shits all over me and ghosts me for doing it. So there you go. Um, who else in the carnival community really fucking annoys me? Um, I'm not sure. I'm sure there are others that, are, that, that rub me the wrong way, at least occasionally. Well, maybe, maybe if you watch some of, some of the content on my channel, Maybe you'd be like, that guy's a fucking idiot too. What do you think? Mm. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I'll share, you, no, I'll share no. some of my content with you sometime. Sure. No, I've, I've enjoyed it. It's <laughs> been fun. And, and I've, you know, some of the questions I've been asked today are not the kind I would have expected. So it's so who, always good who, to be. Yeah. Well, who are your favorites? But apart from like the ladies that you would like to pour your butter on, who are your favorite carnivores that you like to, do you have like a favorite podcast or? Um, no, I mean, I don't really have a lot of time to watch others' podcasts at all closely. I mean, it really has become an all encompassing and full time occupation to run uh, not only my one, but my now three or four YouTube channels uh, and do any justice to any of them. I just don't have the time. Um, Are there any that you like? If you do happen to to listen to, I, I I enjoy I enjoy Sean Baker when he's on task when he's talking about nutrition and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um like me though he does go off task and talk about other things from time to time i'm like eh, whatever right um but i love i love sean he's a he's a, he's a good man I like him a lot um dr barry and barry's good i just don't have time to watch his podcast though um Ken, by the way you were supposed to book in to have another interview with me in the last few weeks where are you ken where are you yeah. Um, apparently, Mrs. Berry finds me refreshing. By the way, yeah, I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> she, she's a, for another she, day. Put her on the carnivore list. She's quite a quite the looker. She's and scored big on that one. Yep. yep, she's an attractive lady as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, just while we're mindlessly objectifying people, let's go for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh. All right. Um, so it, I want to hear you say something nice about a vegetable. I'm almost done here, but you know, before we go, we have to hear you say something nice about vegetable. Yep. I really enjoy garlic. I enjoy onion. Um, as a, you know, as a garnish, as a, you know, um, sometimes Pim will make like you know, garlic butter or something like that, mm -hmm. that we'll have with, with our steak. Um, I use mulian as an expectorant, as a as a decongestant, as a decongestant, making mulian tea. Is that like so a garlic derivative, or what is that? It's it's a weed that grows fucking everywhere here in New Zealand, and it's a biennial plant that grows to, you know, eight feet tall or more uh, by the by the end of the second year, mm -hmm. and it grows these big broad furry leaves and huge flower stem things um, that you can dry and make a tea out of that is a mucolytic and an expectorant. Yeah. Um, well, so that's you know, good for in, that. In Canada, you know, we don't really forage for plants in the winter, you know. I don't know mm. how we how those vegans would survive in the wintertime here. They wouldn't. They wouldn't. <laughs> 